All right, these are the answers to the chapter five packet, and this video will cover sections 5.1 to 5.4. Section 5.1 is entitled The Nature of Energy. The study of energy and its transformations is known as thermodynamics. The study of the relationships between chemical reactions and energy changes that involve heat is known as thermochemistry. Energy is commonly defined as the capacity to do work or to transfer heat. Work is the energy used to cause an object to move against a force. And heat is the energy used to cause the temperature of an object to increase. Again, this information is from your textbook. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. All other kinds of energy are classified as potential energy. When a ball rolls down a hill, we can talk about gravitational forces, but no, gravitational forces do not play a significant role in the way that atoms and molecules interact with one another. So on page 161, they give you an equation that looks like this. The E represents the electrostatic potential energy. Q1 and Q2 are electrical charges on two different objects. D is the distance that separates those objects and K is just a proportionality constant. It has units of joules, meters per square coulomb. As the distance between two charged particles approaches infinity, the electrostatic potential energy between the particles approaches zero. Now, for this next question, actually for both six and seven, it'd be helpful to look at your textbook. The diagram um, shows you in figure 5.3 that if you take two charges that would normally repel each other and you bring them closer together, you are going to increase the potential energy. But if they are going to attract each other, then as they get closer together, the potential energy decreases. So in number six, what's going on here is that you have like charges which repel so as they are brought closer together, the potential energy increases because the repulsive forces try to push them apart. But if they were opposite charges, as you brought them closer together, the potential energy would decrease because attractive forces pull them toward each other. The SI unit of energy is the joule. And when we analyze energy changes, we focus on the portion that we single out for study, which is called the system, and everything else is called the surroundings. You can have an open system in which both matter and energy can be exchanged with the surroundings. We often see examples of a closed system in which energy can be exchanged but not matter. And this figure, uh, 5.4, is an example of a closed system. If a person throws a baseball and the baseball is the system, then the surroundings are doing work on the system. If that baseball breaks a window, then the system is doing work on the surroundings. The mathematical equation for work is work equals force times distance. Heat is defined as the energy transferred from a hotter object to a colder one. And in chemistry, we normally define the substances involved in the chemical reaction as the system and everything else is the surroundings. Section 5.2 is entitled The First Law of Thermodynamics, and we can define the first law as the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed or that energy is conserved in various processes. The internal energy of a system is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of the components of the system. And even though we generally can't determine the actual values of the internal energy, final and initial, for any system, we only need the value of delta E, the change in energy, to apply the first law. It's important to know that delta E has both a number and a unit. Together, these values tell us the magnitude of the energy change, but delta E also has a sign which tells us the direction of the energy change. If the uh, energy at the end is greater than the energy at the beginning, then the sign of delta E is positive, indicating that the system has gained energy from its surroundings. Conversely, if the final energy is less than the initial, 
The sine of delta E is negative, indicating that the system has lost energy to its surroundings. In a chemical reaction, the initial state refers to the reactants, and the final state refers to the products. For figure 5.6, they are going to show you the synthesis of water. The initial state for the synthesis of water is that you start with hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, and then you end with liquid water. The down arrow implies that energy is being lost to the surroundings and delta E is negative. If we were to draw a similar diagram for the decomposition of water, the initial state would be liquid water, the final state would be hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, the arrow would not be down, it would be up, and instead of losing energy to the surroundings, we are actually gaining energy from the surroundings. This would be electrolysis of water, for example, where you have to supply energy in the form of electricity to split the water into its elements. In a closed system, the system may exchange energy with its surroundings in two general ways, either as heat or as work. The change in internal energy can be summarized with equation 5.5, delta E equals Q, which stands for heat, and W stands for work. If Q is positive, then the system is gaining heat, if Q is negative, the system loses heat. If W is positive, then work is being done on the system. If W is negative, work is being done by the system. If delta E is positive, then there is a net gain of energy by the system. If delta E is negative, then there is a net loss of energy by the system. If we have a piece of dry ice, so solid CO2 in a cylinder and piston arrangement similar to the diagram on page 162, warming that cylinder is going to create a positive Q because the system absorbs heat. If it pushes the piston upward, then W is negative because now work is being done by the system on the surroundings. If we have absorbing heat, which is positive 250 joules, but we have negative 90 because we're doing work on the surroundings, then positive 250 and negative 90 would give us a delta E of positive 160. During an endothermic process, such as the melting of ice, heat flows from the surroundings into the system. During an exothermic process, such as the combustion of gasoline, heat flows from the system into the surroundings. Now in the following situation, we have the temperature of the water increasing when it's placed on a hot plate. But then we have the temperature of our skin decreasing as water evaporates on our skin. Now in both cases, we have evaporation of water, but we have a difference in the change of temperature. How do we reconcile the fact that in one case, it seems like the temperature goes up, but in the other case, the temperature goes down? The trick here is to decide, are you part of the system? or are you part of the surroundings? In both situations, evaporation is an endothermic process, but in situation A, the hot plate, which is part of the surroundings, is transferring heat into the system, which is the water in the beaker. And the water in the beaker is getting hotter until it boils. But in situation B, the skin or the body is part of the surroundings. So the temperature on the skin surface is decreasing because it is losing heat. The water molecules are still absorbing heat in both cases. So just pay attention to whether or not the thermometer is part of the system or the surroundings. You can learn more about regulation of body temperature on page 180 where it talks about how perspiration cools the body. Section 5.3 deals with enthalpy and equation 5.6 the mathematical equation for enthalpy is H, which stands for enthalpy, is equal to the internal energy plus pressure times volume. The work involved in either expansion or compression of gases is called pressure volume work. When pressure is constant, then the equation for this type of work becomes work equals negative P times delta V. But since most of the chemical processes that we study in chemistry occur at constant pressure, 
then the change in enthalpy is essentially the change in heat. So in chemistry, the change in enthalpy is more useful to us than the change in internal energy. And for our purposes, there is no difference between enthalpy and internal energy. You can think of the change in enthalpy as simply the change in heat. If liquid water freezes, we're going from liquid to solid, we are decreasing the overall energy. Energy is lost. That's exothermic, negative delta H. The opposite of freezing, melting, would be an endothermic process, positive delta H. Burning propane would be an exothermic reaction, negative delta H. Converting mercury oxide into its elements requires heat to be added. That is an endothermic process, positive delta H. Section 5.4 is entitled Enthalpies of Reaction. The mathematical equation for the enthalpy change, delta H, is the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. And if you see Rxn, that just stands for the word reaction. Now the delta H of the reaction would be either positive or negative. A positive delta H is an endothermic process. A negative delta H is an exothermic process. When you write a balanced chemical equation and you show the delta H next to that balanced equation, we call that a thermochemical equation. Enthalpy is an extensive property, which means that the magnitude of delta H is proportional to the amount or the number of moles of reactant consumed. The enthalpy change for a certain chemical reaction is equal in magnitude, but opposite in sign to the delta H for the reverse. So when you reverse a reaction, you are changing the sign of delta H. And the enthalpy change for a reaction depends on the states for the reactants and products. So when you change from solid to liquid to gas, you are affecting the enthalpy numbers. Here we have problem 5.399 found at the end of the chapter, the combustion of ethanol. First, we're gonna write a balanced thermochemical equation, starting with ethanol. It is burned, so it reacts with oxygen gas, and it produces carbon dioxide and water. Those are both gases. We'll balance the equation by first balancing the carbon, and then we'll balance the six atoms of hydrogen. Finally, we have seven atoms of oxygen on the right, so we balance the oxygen. And now, the last thing to do is to decide if the delta H is positive or negative. We know it's 1235 kilojoules. It does say that heat is released, so the delta H is negative 1235. And look at the units there. I have kilojoules per mole of reaction. That is a standard notation, especially when you have different coefficients. That is not per mole of oxygen. It's actually per three moles of oxygen. So mole of reaction means whatever the coefficients are in that equation, the negative 1235 goes with all of those coefficients. For an enthalpy diagram, we have starting with ethanol and oxygen, they would be on a higher level. We're falling down to a lower level because the products have less energy or enthalpy than the reactants. And the delta H again is negative 1235 kilojoules per mole of reaction. In our next example, we have the decomposition of solid calcium hydroxide into solid calcium oxide and water vapor. The delta H is going to be positive because it says it requires the addition of 109 kilojoules per, of heat. So this is definitely an endothermic reaction in which heat is absorbed. In our energy diagram, we're starting with the solid calcium hydroxide on the lower level. And then after adding 109 kilojoules of heat, we end with solid calcium oxide and water vapor at a higher enthalpy level. In number nine, they talk about the thermite reaction, which involves, involves aluminum and iron three oxide. So aluminum reacting with iron three oxide 
produces aluminum oxide and iron. Now we just have to balance this equation by putting a two in front of the aluminum and the iron. And here is what the picture looks like in your textbook. So clearly this is an exothermic reaction. So the sign of delta H is negative. Now we're gonna do some calculations based on this thermochemical equation. Part A of number 11 says, how much heat is released when one gram of iron three oxide reacts with excess aluminum? So we're gonna start by going from grams of iron three oxide into moles, and we can just calculate the molar mass of iron three oxide from the information on the periodic table. Then this problem also mentions that 848 kilojoules of heat are released for every one mole of iron three oxide. So the correct answer based on three significant figures would be 5.31 kilojoules of heat released. We do not have to use a negative sign in our answer because they are simply asking for the amount of heat that is released. They are not asking us to calculate the delta H value. In part B, we start with 1750 kilojoules of heat and we have to convert this into grams of iron metal. So first, we're gonna convert this from kilojoules into moles of iron three oxide. Then we remember that the stoichiometry of this balanced equation is a two to one ratio between moles of iron and moles of iron three oxide. And then finally, we go to grams using the molar mass of iron. Again, three significant figures, and we get 231 grams of iron produced. In number 12, this is just a reminder that when you multiply all of the coefficients in an equation by some number, you must also multiply the value of delta H by that number. And when you reverse a chemical reaction, you must change the sign of delta H. So in number 12a, everything has been doubled, so the value of delta H is doubled as well. And in letter B, we just flipped the equation around, so now the delta H is positive 890. In number 13, it looks like it's the exact same equation, except for one slight change. Instead of writing two moles of liquid water as a product, we have written two moles of water vapor. So in this reaction, since two moles of H2O liquid have been replaced with two moles of H2O gas, and we know that states of matter are important in determining the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction, the value of delta H is not going to be equal to negative 890. So is it going to be larger or smaller in terms of the magnitude of delta H? Well, recall that we would do this kind of diagram starting with reactants at a higher enthalpy level and then going down to products at a lower enthalpy level. That difference is 890 kilojoules. When we replace liquid water with water vapor, we're going to have a higher enthalpy level because gaseous water molecules are going to be farther apart and traveling faster and had a higher enthalpy than liquid water molecules. So the magnitude of the delta H is going to be less than 890 because the enthalpy of water vapor is higher than the enthalpy of liquid water. In number 15, we're gonna write a balanced chemical equation for the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide we start with H2O2, liquid, and we end with water and oxygen gas. To balance the equation, we put in coefficients of two in front of the hydrogen peroxide and the water. So at this point, what we're doing is we're calculating the delta H for this reaction that was written in part A. So let's take a look at our given information. We have 14.4 kilojoules of heat released for every five grams of hydrogen peroxide. If we did this calculation, that would give us units of kilojoules per gram. We would actually prefer to get kilojoules per mole, so to get rid of grams, since grams are already on the bottom, we'll multiply by a conversion factor that puts grams on top 
and one mole of hydrogen peroxide on the bottom. 34.016 is simply the molar mass of hydrogen peroxide. If we do this math, we get 98.0 kilojoules per mole. Now, is 98.0 the value of delta H for the reaction written in part A? No, it is not, and for several reasons. Number one, the sign of delta H should be negative because it says in this problem that heat is released. But more importantly, take a look at the fact that this is 98.0 kilojoules for every one mole of hydrogen peroxide. The coefficients in the balanced chemical equation clearly show that there are two moles of hydrogen peroxide. So therefore, the correct answer for the delta H for that reaction as written would be negative 196 kilojoules per mole of reaction. If we had divided all of the coefficients by two, so we had coefficients of one, one, and one half for oxygen, then the delta H would be negative 98.0. So just pay close attention to your coefficients and which moles you're talking about. All right, this is problem uh, number 16 in the packet. This is found at the end of your chapter. This is number 5.48. We have a balanced chemical equation starting with liquid benzene and ending with gaseous acetylene. The delta H is positive 630 kilojoules. The enthalpy change for the reverse reaction would be negative 630. And since there is a three next to acetylene, that means that there are three moles of acetylene produced. The delta H for the formation of one mole of acetylene would be taking 630 divided by three, so positive 210 kilojoules. In terms of the reaction being favored, either the forward or the reverse, think of it like this. A ball rolling down a hill would be energetically favored as opposed to rolling a ball up a hill that requires the input of energy. So, in general, we would assume that the reverse reaction, the one that is exothermic, is more likely to occur and would be more thermodynamically favored. In part D, they want to know what would happen if, instead of using liquid benzene as a reactant, what if we had used gaseous benzene? Recall, we've seen diagrams like this before. Here I'm starting with liquid benzene at the bottom and the arrow is pointing up because it is an, exo, is an endothermic reaction, so positive 630 kilojoules. If we had started with gaseous benzene, we would be starting at a higher level, and therefore the delta H would be somewhat less than 630. So because the enthalpy of gaseous benzene is greater than the enthalpy of liquid benzene, the magnitude of delta H for that reaction would be less than 630. All right, well, there is more chapter five, but this marks the end of sections 5.1 through 5.4. I hope those explanations were helpful. Thanks for watching.